Hey, welcome to another episode. I'm Brian Drayson, your host, and today I'm super excited to welcome Megan Klein, founder and CEO of Little Saints, a brand with a mission to radically transform the way we imbibe by creating non-alcoholic beverages that deliver the pleasureful tastes and smells of cocktails. Hey, Megan, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Brian. Yeah, my pleasure. So, I find what you do very, very interesting and different from what I see out there. So why don't you please take a second to introduce yourself and tell the audience more about the company? Sure. So Little Saints, um, we make non-alcoholic cocktails and spirits um, fueled by functional mushrooms instead of alcohol so that no one has to choose between having fun and feeling good. Um, I created Little Saints during the pandemic. I had... Um, you know, I'm a not a teetotaler. Like I love cocktails. I, um, you know, I pre pandemic, I was going out for work drinks or social drinks five nights a week, loved it, love cocktail culture, love bartenders. But during the pandemic, I really realized like, wow, this makes me feel terrible. Like my brain feels foggy. Um, you know, we're all entrepreneurs. I was like, I'm just not performing at 100%. My skin looks awful. And so I wanted to just create something that was better than alcohol. It wasn't like, a, I'm not going to drink anymore. Like drinking is a bad thing. It was just like, I wanted to have a non-alcoholic alternative. I tried everything out there on the market. Like all the marketers would do. I bought everything. Everything had, was like either sparkling water with flavors or um, juice mocktails of some sort or soda. And I wanted to create something that was like a car. So we have this can and then we also have a bottled spirit. They're all um, sugar free, five calories per serving. Cause I was like, well, if I'm going to drink, if I'm going to have sugar, I'm just going to have like alcohol, you know? <laughs> and then um, they are fueled by functional mushrooms. So there's reishi in the cans and then there's lion's mane in the spirit. So when did you launch the company? I launched the company a Officially, the first can that I sold was uh, on um, May 29th, 2021. It was um, during, there's a, I was in Detroit. I moved to Detroit alone during the pandemic um, to launch Little Saints. I can't really explain why, but I love Detroit. I There's a techno festival called Movement in Detroit, and I have a little mint green fending trailer that I took, and I parked in front of this amazing nightclub there called Spike Spotlight, and we sold Little Saints, like, out of the trailer. That was my first um, day, but that summer was, like, really crazy supply chain issues, and I couldn't get cans made that I liked, so I had these ugly tall boy cans that I sold out of the trailer, and then I didn't get little nice cans that you see until like October. So we actually launched our website November, 2021. So we're about two and a half, three years old. Okay. So you sort of, please correct me if I'm wrong in any case, you started with the wholesale. Is that correct? Not so, no, sorry. Not sort the, of. Yeah, right? yeah. I, so I really started with like events, sales and marketing, like out of the trailer. And then when I really started, I did have the website up, but that was only doing like, I don't know, 10,000 a month in sales. And then because my background is in, um, like I, so I had, I founded a refrigerated dip and dressing business. So like we were selling, like it's called field and farmer and it's like refrigerated dressings that are sold at whole foods, for example. And so I was very, I am familiar, very familiar with like wholesale distribution and how that works and like how to make that work. And that's, so that's what I was going to do with little saints. I launched with the major alcohol distributor in California. You know, they were trying to grow their non-alc program and I hired an expensive salesperson there. And like, you know, I thought we were doing the right thing. And it just, we could not, there was a big disconnect in between like the end use customer, like you and me that wanted to have a non-alcoholic drink on the shelf or on a bar menu and like the whole distribution network, which includes like the distributors, the trucks, the decision makers at the bars who aren't, who weren't really familiar with it at the time. So it was painful. I mean, we delivered one big PO, they didn't reorder. I had to buy the inventory back. We sold through maybe a third of it. And right, so and that, then that was all of 2022, which was like a bloodbath. Like we did, I don't know, we did <laughs> about 500,000 in sales and we lost like 1.2 million or something. And I was self-funding it and like my family had invested too at the point. So it was just like miserable. And um, 
I was super upset because I'm, I have a Kellogg MBA. I've run a company before. I was like, how the hell did I do this? Like, what is going wrong? You know, and I was just putting money into all the wrong things that were not having an ROI. So then, um, in the end of 2022, I met like who is now my amazing CMO, Katie. And we were like, there's nothing that we're doing is making any sense. Like we have all these experts. I had like very seasoned people on the team telling us what to do and like nothing was working. So we just like fired everyone and um, just decided we were going to pivot and become a D2C company in 2023. And then like you know, the first half of 2023, the first ads we did was for like dry January, 2023. So like, we definitely had a lot to learn, uh, in terms of like ad content and working. We had never, I had never even worked with like a digital ads buyer before. Um, so our return on ad spend was not that great for the first six months of the year. And our burn was pretty high. And then we really figured it out and took content in house and like, honestly fired our content agencies. We did still work with like one agency on UGC videos, but Katie who was doing all the content in house. I did a little tiny bit of it and we just bootstrapped it and we really figured out what was working and what. So I would say by December, 2023, we like really do what we were doing. And then like our sales have completely exploded in 2024. We've grown 600% year over year. And like um, our return on ad spend is like over 2.5 for the year. And on, on Meta, we're not even advertising on TikTok yet. We don't have enough inventory. So we like really feel like, you know, Katie's a genius and we just sort of cracked the code. And but it was because we were doing it ourselves. It's because we like actually like are in the account and we like are making the content ourselves, but we know what our customers want. And we're like, not, I mean, I know there's probably agencies listening to this. So like, God bless you. But like, I feel like there's a lot of disconnect sometimes when you're working with an agency that's like just putting you into their queue and like doing whatever they do. That's like not as customized to your customers and to your brand as you need it to be. And so I feel like we really figured out like a good niche for ourselves. Okay. You just mentioned a bunch of interesting stuff. I would like to touch this on. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to prioritize. Sorry, that was a lot. Brian. First. Yeah, because, you know, I would love to address that content side of things because I've been talking about and recording content and writing content on that um recently which is that brands are turning into content machines and i think that's the exact title of the latest episode uh of the podcast because oh, it's cool. a company that actually uh turned their company their team into content creators and all of them like they're they are a team of probably i don't know six or 10 or something like that. All of them create content. Of course, it's a small company. It's a seven figure company, but they have a small team and they, all of them generate content regardless of the role. And that's really inspiring. Not only the content for social, they are the face of the brand on the website and, you know, everywhere really. So I think that yes, brands, regardless of agencies, brands these days need to own the content creation. But it's because back in the day, many years ago, brands used to post quotes, used to post um, uh, an image they, uh, they, they took from a photo shoot they did a few months ago or something like that. Fast forward today, 2024, it's not enough. And it's not enough to get UGC because, again, everyone says, and I believe UGC is that. Actually, what's that is the AGC, the actor-generated content right? People don't believe in that anymore. You can still get away with that, but the best of the best, the best brands, at least I, I know and I, I, I interview here in the pod, might be um, Battlebox and many other cool brands out there. They generate content, not only short form, but long form content as well. Cool. Did you say Battlebox? I want to look them up. Not now, but... Um... Yeah, it's one of, it's re a really recent episode, probably five or four episodes before this one. I had the pleasure of interviewing Sean Roman, the CEO, pretty cool uh, guy, pretty cool company. And what they do is exactly this. I interviewed like right in the beginning of this pod in 2021, I believe it was the CEO of a company called Echelon Fitness. That company started manufacturing bikes. You know, I think it was indoor bikes. So that's all they did. But then 
to boost sales for bikes, they started generating content like uh, online classes for you know people to you know use the bike, um, and then they started generating more content. And this is powerful. They started generating more content than Netflix. They had like ten studios worldwide. Wait, what? Content, yes, generating content twenty four seven. And they had they partnered up with Pitbull, Shakira, and I don't know how many. So content creation is a must for companies. And I'm a total believer, and I own an agency that brands. Oh, sorry. Should own yeah. Art. No, no, I'm a total. I yeah. I I appreciate working with brands that own the content creation. Otherwise, now the audience is not the filter anymore. Hello, 2024. That before iOS 14, back in 2021. The audience was the filter. So people like us or agencies, marketers, and even brands had the chance of, you know, playing around with the audiences. And we felt like we had superpowers, you know? Oh, I know this tactic, this little thing. But now it's about the filter through the message. We target broad audiences and we need to filter and, you know, vet them through the message. And if the message is something that we can do by partnering up with a few influencers only, then that's not going to resonate anymore. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I totally agree. It's interesting. Like we, yeah, we've gone through a very similar journey. UGC recently stopped working for us. Uh, really what's working for us right now is the founder assets. And so I'm like, I don't actually personally, like I do. <laughs> I don't love, I mean, I love, like, I'm like passionate about the company, but actually putting the phone in the right place and having to do it. I'm like, ah, like I, the doing the founder stuff feels so silly to me sometimes, but it's working the best. And I don't know if you've seen, but we actually are most so like, I'm sure you've seen this, like organic social media is doing nothing. So we were like, literally no, no people are seeing our pretty photographs. And we know we need those on our Instagram, for example, to like you know, when people look at the brand, like, oh, okay, is this brand cool? But we actually started doing me and Katie, my CMO, we're also like good friends. We started like, we were like, all right, we're going to do something ridiculous. And like, one of the things that people are always asking about is like, what does Reishi Mushroom do? What does Lion's Mane feel like? Like, what does Damiana feel like? So we created characters out of the um, ingredients. Like Damiana is like a PR executive and a sex coach and like reishi mushrooms like this kind of like two cool girl like yoga LA because reishi mushrooms really chill lion's mane is like kind of like a I love Andrew Huberman I have lion's mane is like an Andrew Huberman like super like biohacker like optimizer of health and then um terpene queen is just bonkers because terpenes are like the aromatics that lift our mood and they're energizing and I she's just like a plant psycho like fun person and so we started doing we start dressing up like the characters and just doing stuff with them and we were just going to play around with it we have not put them on paid yet but those are our only videos that like have any reach like actually we spent a bunch of money on a founder video for me because like we have a really unique story in the non-elk space and we wanted to tell it and um the video of me dressing up like an idiot like Damiana and like doing like dancing at space in Miami has more views and that was free Katie and I went and danced at space one morning took a video acted like idiots had a lot of fun and like we're also like acting like a Damiana would act then the founder video that we spent a lot of money on and it was like highly produced it's so ridiculous you know why why my take and the take of people I, I speak with every day is that People want to be entertained. They are tired of the classic ad, the classic video or static. They want to be entertained or, or consume value. They, they are tired of seeing someone with a mic here speaking to the camera. I am blah, founder of X company. Like they don't want that. And <laughs> I know there's place, there's a time and place for everything for top of the funnel middle of the funnel and bottom of the funnel content. But these days, organic, if you want to be all like, of, if you want to make like uh, bottom of the funnel content only, it's not going to work. Like buy this stuff. Yes, some people are in market to buy and there are different tactics to get those people and still, let's say, between quotes, people from your competitors. But 
organic is actually working pretty well for many companies. But it depends on the platform okay. and it depends whether it's long form or short form content. And if you hate doing content, that's fine. You can just find someone that is your full time creator or a part time creator. For example, Battlebox, they don't generate content themselves. You know what they did and how they found their creator? They, they did something that these days we all call a silly move because they call it that way too. But back then they didn't know in 2015 or something like that. They they installed a, a pre-purchase survey, not a post-purchase survey, like a pre-purchase survey. So people were about to buy and they said, please don't buy, please fill out this survey first. And re regardless of the, of the reason why they did it, that's the reason they found the creator they have today full-time. They found that many people were coming from a creator to buy. So they looked him, they looked him up and it turned out it was a cash paying customer. He wasn't a, like a creator looking for, you know, uh, whatever, uh, generating content as a business. He did it because he was passionate about what they did. He was passionate about what he could do with that stuff. So he started generating content from a genuine place and they said, okay, keep doing that. We'll give you, I don't know, 500 bucks. And then they said, oh, keep doing that. But now we'll give you, I think first they gave them free stuff, then 500 bucks. And then they said, move your entire family to, I think it was Texas and start recording content for us full time. And now if you see the long beard man on LinkedIn or on, sorry, on YouTube and all the shorts reels, that's the guy, Brandon, full time creator, but he was a cash paying customer. So every time I, uh, since then, I always say the same thing to people like you can start by getting content from not only yourself and your team, but from your customers. Yeah, I love that. I really love that. And you know what, that we're doing the same thing. I I could not be any more excited. We are, have some, we've narrowed it down to a few candidates. We're hiring a full-time content creator in-house. We were like trying to be a little too bootstrap. Like I'll do content, Katie will do content. We'll like try to grab friends in and, you know, like we're just trying to piece it together and then it ends up taking more time. So we're getting a content creator in-house. And then I would feel great Katie would feel great too, just like being behind the camera, just like setting up the angles. Like I, I'm like an old person when it comes to like how to use my phone and how to like put a piece of video together. So I'm so excited to have a content creator do it for us. It, it, again, it's it's amazing, but uh, I couldn't stop. I mean, as a founder being like present in the content creation, but, it, but again, it's not a must. And you know, when it's not a must or when it is, when you look at what other companies out there are doing, like small companies, we don't talk about Coca-Cola or the big companies out there. We talk about what small or mid-sized companies are doing. So in yeah. this case, brand presence, uh, sorry, founder's presence is great, but otherwise find someone truly passionate, that's important, truly passionate about what they do. You can see through the eyes of this guy, for example, talking about Battlebox again, you can see that the guy is passionate about that. I told him that in the interview before learning that he was a customer. It was like, this guy loves what he's doing. Like he, yeah. he wasn't nice. He was describing, it was like, like a, the tool of passion or for whatever, you know? So that was it. So if you're that's passionate so cool. about what you do, that's something. Yeah. yeah. And we all are, we, that, yeah, we feel lucky about that and we have a really good time at work and now we'll have someone who can document that. And that's amazing. Going back. What do you, do you find, I have a, I have a question for you actually, if you don't mind, do you find that? Cause we have a really high open rate on our emails. And of course, I think our team does a really wonderful job writing our emails. So like, but I'm like, it, is it cause people are loyal to the brand cause they see us just acting like ourselves and then they'll open the email or is it the, e like, do you think there's a ripple effect? Have you seen a ripple effect? Like with all of the other metrics, when the company themselves is creating the content and it's really authentic. I wish I had the answer to that, but I do know that there's a 100% an effect. If people know more about the brand, more about you, they they could they 
they they build a bond with you they build rapport they connect with you somehow of course when 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 they receive somewhat something from you they will be more willing to open that that's my guess right it's hard to measure but it makes sense like if someone you you love or you care about let's say sends you an email a postcard or whatever you will receive it better than if it comes from someone you don't know and what what happens these days with the online is that we feel you know the same that happens with famous people right we feel that we know them that we are friends and they don't have a clue about us right but we feel that we build a bond with them so if someone rich you know reaches out to us even if they are not famous but they made us laugh they entertained us they brought body to us when you receive an email from them heck yeah i would be 100 percent more open to opening some something like that yeah 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 totally that's a good point yeah so i wanted to ask you something going back i i i warned you before that after you spoke the first time i i that had was a, a long monologue i, I apologize some of, them, <laughs> some of them about content which we covered already and some others about wholesale because i wanted to zoom in on something because you tested that first and then you transitioned to DDC. And most of the time I heard, you know, the like the reverse, like some companies starting as a DDC company and then trying to uh, be in different retail stores. So you, you, you started with that. We, you started with wholesale. And I, I wanted to ask you in case you can share your lessons learned with the audience. What do you think that um, didn't go as planned specifically? You said that if I if I got it right, that people like weren't as, you know, the salespeople or the people in the in the working for the retail store uh, weren't as, you know, um, trained in what you did. So they didn't know how to properly explain that to customers. So there was a clear disconnect. So do you think that affected sales? Totally. I think, you know, I was just at BevNet, which is a conference for like the beverage industry. And I was listening to GoPuff and the GoPuff um, had leader said something really interesting. He was just like, yeah, we're looking for brands to bring their own demand. And so like, I think what would happen with Little Saints in the beginning is that we had less than 10,000 Instagram followers. We weren't doing paid ads yet so like really no one knew who we were and we were relying on a lot of old school methods i mean i don't know what you think but i think marketing has just totally completely changed like pre-pandemic post-pandemic even in the past two years it's completely changed so i was relying on what i knew from like traditional wholesale marketing like buy shelf space you know like get demos like just do super old school stuff and that wasn't working because we didn't have the level of brand awareness. And so like, not only it was two part, number one, we didn't have the brand awareness. And number two, just the category was too new. Like people, most people were, especially bartenders weren't thinking like, oh, I need a non-alcoholic option on my menu. They were like, ew, why would I use that? You know, I still want people to buy alcohol, not knowing that like, it's way more profitable for everyone to have non-alc on the menu because it just prevents people from ordering a sparkling water. But that knowledge base was like not there as much as it is now. So it was, yeah, it was twofold. It was just like the category being too new and then us not having enough brand awareness. And I can say that because I used to run, you know, or, or I founded Field and Farmer, which is that refrigerated salad dressing brand. And we were really relying on I mean, it's so funny because back then you think like, oh yeah, those sales, like all you can really do when you get a national retailer like Whole Foods is like get sale tags up there, like pay to be on their Instagram, like get a celebrity. And none of that stuff really is actually getting like eyeballs on you. So now because we are investing so heavily in meta ads, we're not even doing TikTok ads yet. I know that's not what we should be doing. I know that like TikTok has a higher return on ad spend, but like meta is working for us our customer is pretty much more on meta and like we we've gotten a lot of wholesale inbound requests through our ads so now it's just like we are like we consider ourselves a digitally native company even though we started out the other way and we have a direct relationship with our customers and we're really reaching people like through mostly i would say our ads unless you know and then we have a pretty engaged following but mostly through our ads 
Thank you. So, yeah, something I heard before is something you said about, you know, bringing your own demand, uh, you know, to retail. It's something that um, it's very true. You know, brands, um, brands think that, as you said, they would buy uh, shelf space and they would start selling. That's one thing. The other is the packaging. Well, you sell a, you sell your product in a can, right? But you know, brands with yeah, a more complex packaging. Uh, it's a beautiful packaging, but you know, um, brands need to explain probably a little bit more and design the packaging wisely because one thing is to sell a product online and they get a the product, they know what they bought, and another thing is compete right there on the shelf with other brands. And the other one that he recently received. In I'm subscribed to the Chew on this newsletter. Totally recommend everyone to, to subscribe to it. Which it's list? By Ronak Shah. The Chew on this newsletter. Chew on uh, this. Okay. Chew on this is by Ronak yeah. Shah and Ash Milwani at Upbe. I had the pleasure of interviewing him, uh, at, um, Ronak, in 2022, I think it was. And they, they recently said that, I think it was last week or this week, that pricing... It's one thing they didn't consider when entering uh, retail because they said, hey, you know, I sell the, I don't know, they sell supplements, you know, at, I don't know, uh, $30. But hey, in retail, probably that's too expensive. And people don't know who I am there. So probably I shouldn't be competing at $30 there. And I should probably shrink my margins or reduce my margins a little bit and decrease the price to be more competitive there and give a chance for people to get to know my product. So things like those, like some other people, uh, some other company interview recently said something about educating people in the stores. Of course, if you are in Walmart nationwide, you cannot possibly educate all of them. So, but if you start with one or two or three locations, well, probably it's easier to be there and try to be present, educating people, sending them gifts or something like that, you know, so they can sell the product better to everyone coming. Of course, depending on the industry, there aren't always people present there, depending on the category, right? But um, yeah, I think those are a few takeaways from uh, my lessons learned, at least from the uh, episodes that I recorded. Yeah, totally. So uh, you grew, after you pivoted to DTC, you grew by um, 600% year over year. So I'm curious to hear uh, about the, um, you know, what contributed to that exponential growth? So a couple of things contributed to it. The first was, you know, we, we invested a lot of money in 2023 in ads and we, we did like burn kind of a lot of money you know we burned a million dollars in um, 2023 and we just broke even for the quarter in 2024 and it's june so like we really like we kind of invested heavily and we cut our burn rate from or whatever you call it like it was like 60 percent burn to income to like four percent burn to revenue and now we're at break even and so I would say part of it was just like learning and like really figuring out like, oh, like we do need way more content than we thought we did. You know, like our digital ads guy is great. I love him. Like Ben at Accelerated Digital, like he was kind of always telling us like, you don't have enough content. You don't have enough content. And I think that's why like we weren't doing so well. And so then we like figured out how to, did we figured out the messaging was, that was working. So basically we just like made our ads much more efficient. And then the second thing was we dropped CBD from the cans. So our cans used to have CBD and reishi mushroom in them as the functional ingredients. And, um, CBD is a pain in the ass. And like, obviously like for ads, we had to kind of do a second, like, I don't even know what we were doing a second landing page. So it wasn't like a direct click through. Yeah. And, um, that went from, you know, we did, 200,000 in sales in December, the first, like we went from like basically about a hundred, we could not break 150,000 a month, like with the CBD. And then the month we took them out, it, it out in like mid-December, we got to $200,000 a month. And then we went to 500 and then we went to 700 and it was just kind of like, I know it's crazy. So I th think it was just a great, we were, our timing was really good. Like we took CBD out. I think every year that dry January happens, dry January gets a lot of press and like everyone's kind of thinking, rethinking their drinking. And so like the category gets a big boost. And then every year we've thought like, okay, maybe like dry January is going to be a huge bump. And then we're going to have like a bad 
like after, you know, like then it's not going to go so well, but we, I mean, we only have two years of data, but like both times, like demand just keeps going up, which is incredible. Yeah. Now it's summertime. So, you know, I think it will keep growing, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's interesting. So how did you discover that CBD was the thing that was hurting you or, or, or you didn't, you did it because of something else? No, we were listening to people like so many of our inbound emails would be like, does this get me high? Like, am I going to fail a drug test? Right. Can I drink this if I'm pregnant? What if my kid accidentally drank this? Like people just did not, even though there's a lot of education on CBD and THC, like our customer base did not understand it. It was much more of a hindrance. And then just, you know, we're always out when you're a beverage founder, you always have these things like with all, so many groups of people and so many people in like the type of people that I wanted to sell to would actually be like, actually, this is a hindrance. Like I would love to bring it because the packaging's pretty and I love the way it tastes, but I'm embarrassed to bring CBD over to my friend's house for dinner because I don't right. think they're going to like it. And it was just this sort of taboo thing. And I had probably honestly held on to it for too long. If I could do it over again, I would have just gotten it out like in the beginning of 2023. But I was really convinced that people were going to little saints for the take the edge off feeling. And I thought that CBD was the only ingredient that was delivering that. And then in the middle of 2023, we found a new reishi mushroom supplier. That's like the super potent, pure, like highly concentrated premium supplement grade reishi mushroom. And that has a better physical effect than the CBD did. So like after that, then when I was like, oh, okay, I don't feel like I'm compromising the feeling or experience that people are expecting from little saints by switching. So then, I mean, I should have switched like the minute we found that ingredient, but it took about six months and then we, we totally switched. Right. Interesting. So something about you said that, um, about, you know, not making the decision sooner of, you know, removing TBD. There's a book I didn't read, but I want to, it's on my wish list and somebody recently recommended it here in the pod. It's called Blink. I think it's by Malcolm Gladwell. It's about, yeah. I believe, making decisions, you know, with a blink of an eye and not double thinking stuff. And yeah, you know, sometimes that good, that's good. And sometimes I think it's not. And then I think that there's this other book I read, which I love, which is uh, called Atomic Habits. It's it's pretty well known in, in the productivity space. And the author says something like, there are decisions to be made in 30 seconds in 30 minutes and in 30 days and he describes oh, yeah. which ones are a fit for each of them and i love that so it's 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 pretty cool yeah i just want to mention that sorry so thank you no i love that i've read that too it's like if a decision is not like the make or break the end of the world just make it just like make it right away like there are, i think jeff bezos who i don't love frankly but like he does have a thing of like 98% of his decisions he just makes right away and the ones that like really like like are make or break a company you know or make or break your life then you like spend a ton of time like getting all the information that you need but I I like that practice because it uh, it allows us to tap into our intuition which is you generally usually right right and then we spend a lot of time like trying to gather data or facts to like validate our intuition but it's only just because we don't trust ourselves and we're afraid something's going to go wrong so it's exactly. generally just like so much better exactly so i wanted to ask you quickly about you know meta ads i know that by the way i just wanted to say something um i i've been speaking <laughs> about these all along as well it's meta ads for just for context for you and for everyone uh listening or watching this it's um, the number one channel for most successful brands. You know, client, uh, channel diversification, it's a thing. It's something that all of us want because we live in a rented land, whether it's Meta, TikTok, Twitter, uh, Google, you don't know what's going to happen with your accounts, especially in your space, right? So we want to diversify. Battlebox says, for example, they want each channel to be tops, I think it was, <laughs> 16% of the revenue, more or less, but the number one channel for them and for many other successful brands is still Meta. So mm -hmm. I know that is, it, and correct me if I'm wrong again, it was a significant part of your acquisition strategy, by that, but it has been kind of unpredictable and expensive, I mean, for all of us, honestly. So how do you navigate those challenges and how do you mitigate them? Well, um, 
we we did stay very focused even though we have seen like all brands like we've seen our ROI go up and down like we were like we are not going to be reactive and try to then do a whole TikTok strategy when we are not we don't have the team for it we don't have a content creator for it we were like we were just going to stick with this so we really um you know if things aren't working we just pull back spend we are constantly feeding our ads guy new content um men have been like a really great audience for us like i don't think that the non-alc industry had been like paying enough attention to men i don't even think our brand had been which seems like ridiculous because like we in we think about our brand as like equal to men and women you know but in our content we were i suppose just like choosing mostly women and i'm a woman and i'm 45 so i'm like a little bit older so and we what we've seen was um that you know we're attracting the type of person that is behind the ad or it's behind the content and yeah. so like our most successful ad was just like this picture we took of our friend Nicola, who's this like really amazing bartender in New York. And he looks super New York hipster. Like he's got like a long beard. He's like got tats and stuff. And that was so both polarizing and it started to getting the dudes to buy it. I was like, oh shoot, like, is that, is it that easy? Like people are kind of buying from someone who they trust because they like see themselves in them some way. So we've really been, um, both listening to our male customers through comments and DMs and stuff, and then also like using more male talent or friends or who it's some of the people in the ads are our friends. So like we're really been um, seeing good um, some like we've been getting a boost for like being more equitable in our content. And actually, I would say at this point we are like the men convert better than the women because <laughs> they think women are just like there's so much in the we don't consider ourselves a wellness company we consider ourselves like a badass alcohol alternative but there's so many like there's so much competition for like women in quotes in the wellness space and so yeah i think it's been helpful for us to just think like a little bit outside of the box in terms of like making sure that we're talking to like our existing customers who love us that aren't being talked to by other brands I mean, I, uh, to me at least, it makes a hundred percent. I mean, it makes a lot of sense what you said about men buying when they saw other men in the ads. Yeah. We buy what we see. All of us. We sometimes are yeah. you know, conscious about it, and sometimes we are not. But we all do. You know, you buy, or we used to buy uh, on some uh, from some beer brands because we loved to party. So in the ads, what did we see? people in a party, having a great time, sit around with friends, happy. So we bought the experience. We don't buy, I mean, there's something called the external benefits and the internal ones. To, to make it short, we don't buy because of the external benefits. We buy because of how that makes us feel, which is the internal thing. This is in a book called um, how, Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. And it's something pretty cool. If you look at, if you pay attention to the chewing gum commercials, it's not about the flavor. It's about how the chewing gum makes the person in the ad feel. So this, there's, for example, this guy that wants to approach this girl, but they feel insecure. They 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 are shy, and all of a sudden it's like Pope. They the chewing gum, and now they they approach the girl and they are more secure. But breath probably is the external problem they have. That's the, yeah. the what the, what the chewing gum solves but they don't address that they address what bad breath is preventing them from doing and how it's making them feel so if we can do the same thing with our content it's like oh this guy you you did it yourself you sold you sold the guy yourself you said you know this is my friend uh super cool bartender in new york like a hipster style with a long beard you just did it yourself. So men were like, oh, this dude looks so cool and he's ranking this thing. So why can't I do the same thing? Right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. So um looking back, you mentioned that you had, you know, I mean, if if you had to start from scratch, um, I think that you mentioned um, in the call that we did prior to this that you'd spend less money on events and sponsorships <laughs> and focus more on donating products specifically. Could you please elaborate on on that? 
Yes, if I may be direct, I would totally, again, trust my intuition and not spend a cent of our money or any of my time on influencer marketing. It's total BS. Like I had a P I was spending a ton of money on PR and not only like, was it a lot of money, but it also was like calls and team and so much management. And it was like endless calls about like, did that person get the package? So there'd be like a list of influencers. And then it was all about like, did these people get packages? And maybe what the influencers are doing is like taking a picture of the packaging and it does not do anything. And it is like a huge time suck. And that would have been such a better waste uh, spend of money and time to just be doing the content on our own and spending it on like meta ads. And so that is the old way of doing things. That's like what every PR firm is going to come to you with like, oh, you need to get in front of these influencers and like, that's going to help grow the brand, but we didn't see any conversion from that. So I would just not do that. Oh my God, I would have so much more money in the bank than we do now. Um, I would, events are great. Like I love, first of all, I love donating to causes that I love. I love like supporting like people like who are doing cool stuff. I love supporting their events. Like we totally will donate to those all day long, as long as it's a good fit but like paying for event sponsorships is not something that you should do. And I don't even know what the number is. Maybe you're at, you're at 10 million in sales at least where like the end. And then you also have to be on enough shelves so that when people go, go to the event, then like maybe the next day they go to the grocery store or the next day they go to the bar and they buy a little saints cocktail or something. We were spending on money on events before we were um, on shelf. And in my experience, I do not think that many people go to an event and then buy a product online. We, every person would be like, oh, did you put a sign up with a QR code? Of course we did. And no one ever bought from that. Like, and we, you know, I had a little mint green vending trailer and I was dressed up like a terpene queen and we're a lot of fun. We're not some like boring brand with like a tablecloth, you know? And like, we still weren't getting any sales from those events. So it's just like donate, show up the places that like resonate with your brand and your audience so that people will see it. But I don't think that events, paid events make sense until you have like really like a saturated shelf space in the area where you're doing the event. Right. Or I suppose agree. like if you can get really great content out of it, back to your point of content, like maybe if the event's affordable, like never spend like 20 or $50,000 on events. That's so stupid. But like, if you can, you know, like get like a really great event, like we're doing Lollapalooza this year. I'm so excited. And like, nice. it was affordable to us. And like, you know, we're, we're bringing a lot to the table for them. They're bringing a lot to the table for us. And we're going to go and like, you know, the terpene queen and reishi mushroom and all those things are going to show up and we're going to video them. And we're going to like video, like people really drinking little saints. And so we'll get like amazing content for that. So like, it's more of a content play for us primarily, um, you know, like brand recognition and then like, and then also wholesale. But I just think you need to know why you're doing it and like really maximize the content out of it if you're going to spend money on event. Yeah. And as you said, there's a time and a time and place for everything. So maybe it wasn't for you back then. And then when you are 10 million or more, you might find a way to make it work for you. The right event as Lollapalooza or some other things that are worth your while. But probably if you're starting up, it's not the first thing you should have in mind as a growth lever, at least. Yeah. And listen, everyone knows, you probably know this too, every brand owner, every CMO, we could spend the entire day all day long replying to people that want us to spend money on their events or want us to like spend money on their agency. And you just like have to say no, because it's sexy and it's fun. And it's like, oh, cool. I could be at your event and I could be a sponsor. It's such a waste of time. Yeah. So what's next for your company for Little Saints? Oh my gosh. Well, we are, first of all, we're having a lot of fun and we are going to continue to grow um, as a team that like is scrappy and like uses our intuition for growth. And so like, that is like our overarching mission. And then we are, um, we haven't even launched Amazon yet because we haven't had enough inventory. We are like selling like crazy on our website. So we are going to launch Amazon next month. We launched Sprouts, which is a national, you know, Sprouts, like it's a national retailer. That's like going to be our first um, retail chain that launches july 1st um that's in a couple of weeks um so amazon and sprouts are two big things we're in talks with some other national retailers um and then we need to get on tiktok shop 
I don't know, within the next three months, but we don't want to do it wrong. And, and, um, you know, Meta's converting for us. So I would give us like three or four months to figure that out too. There's a lot of room for growth. We're very excited, like that we are doing so well. And there's like a lot of like really easy things. That's amazing. Yeah. TikTok shops probably could spend hours talking about that too, because it's not like running ads. They set it and forget it. It ads are not that way either. Don't get me wrong, but it doesn't require a media buyer or the same role. It's more of if you want like a cold outreach agency within a company because you need depending on the company and the all organic traction you get as a business you need to reach out mm-hmm. to many you know affiliates many creators and user content see what converts it's like a totally different department for a, for mm-hmm. a brand some brands are finding great success with it but some of them you know they they, they are still trying to figure it out because it's really really manual it's not as you know, setting TikTok ads or organic up. It's a totally oh, different so thing. Cool. So, yeah, yeah. Um, it's um it's all a different thing. But yeah. So mm-hmm. before we go, I wanted to ask you one more question, which is uh what I call the great the uh, the the grateful moment, if you want, which is um he, to give a shout out to someone you admire, you follow, uh or I don't know, someone that has helped you in your career, former boss or a mentor, probably. Um, yeah, so who I always think about, it's like my dream to meet her is Sarah Blakely of Spanx. Um, you know, I I have a Kellogg MBA. I understand the importance of data. And we do, of course, like work with data as the base of things of our company all the time. But I am really committed to trusting my intuition in business and like showing people that that's not just like a woo woo feminine thing. It's actually good business and it works. And like Sarah Blakely is the only person that I know that's talked openly about that. You know, like I've, I've heard her talk about how she would ask the universe for help or like, you know, she, she grew her business like organically by trusting her intuition. And I, um, you know, I, I really look up to her for like having like a kick ass, like good profitable business that she sold and really staying true to that. Amazing. Before we go, please tell the audience where they can go to learn more about you and the company. Thank you. You can go to um, littlesaints.com is our website. Our Instagram is at little saints co. Um, and that's the same as our Facebook. And you can see the uh, Damiana Reishi characters on our Instagram. That is the, that's where they live. Amazing for everyone listening to this episode or watching it. Why not? Uh, unless you are already there, please go to the DDCinsider.com, click on the episode name, and you will see in the show notes everything that she mentioned, including the website, the Instagram, and the all the all the fan characters that will be there waiting for you. So this was amazing, <laughs> amazing Megan. Uh, thank you for your time and for all the value you brought to the table today. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed our conversation.